So, talk about microbeam facilities. So this is a schematic, uh, or not, a map of the rare earth facility. And uh, I suppose I can use this and say, we have the accelerator, beam comes out, there's a magnet here, the one that's called M1, takes the beam upstairs for our main microbeam station. There's a switching magnet which puts the beam into various other beam lines. In this position is where Yunping is developing the neutron microbeam. If you go straight through here, you end up in our broad beam irradiation facility. Uh, well, the two parts of a track segment or neutron work is done there. Through this bend, if you go straight ahead, you end up with uh, Andrew's X-ray microbeam here. And then there are a pair of magnets that bend the beam upstairs and the permanent mag magnet microbeam station is, is in that location. So these are things that we currently have at RARF. The charged particle microbeam, alpha particles of 7 to 120 kV or 8 to 25 kV protons, kV per micron. 0.6 micron dis diameter spot, 10,000 cells per hour. I think this has, yes. We have the X-ray microbeam with uh, monochromatic X-rays, 4.5 kV, uh, 2 micrometer diameter spot. Broad beam irradiations, track segment, uh, alpha particles, protons, and deuterons. Uh, we have a neutron facility with a wide range of monoenergetic uh, neutrons available. We have uh, imaging systems to support the, uh, the microbeam work. Uh, Multicolor fluorescence, epifluorescence, multi-photon is integrated in the end station and uh, an interference uh, technique called immersion morale imaging. So uh, we have uh, support for sample preparation and dosimetry for all of these uh, factors. So the microbeam transport itself, we have the singletron, we have a beam line, we have some beam defining slits here, we have the 90 degree magnet, the object aperture is located just above that. The limiting aperture is located just before the electrostatic, the first electrostatic triplet. 27 inch concrete floor. Uh, the second triplet is here and the end station with its exit window is, is there and that's where the irradiation takes place. Uh, that's just, we don't need to look at that there. Uh, so let's look at a little bit of detail on these pieces. There is the accelerator in its pressure tank and the beam comes out through this beam line. Uh, there is a, a box here which has a main beam stop and that is to stop the beam when you don't want it to go upstairs. So this, it just comes in and physically blocks it. And there are also four slits, top and bottom, top and side, which uh, define the size of the beam at this location. And these are remotely controllable from the, the uh, accelerator control room. Uh, there's a, a steering magnet uh, at, the, at the entrance to the 90 degree magnet. This is a 90 degree magnet beam comes in here and is directed upwards. Now there's a, a several things here uh, just above the, uh, the magnet. The two parts of it, one is the, the electrostatic switch is located there and that's a uh, a, a couple of small plates so when you put a, a few kilovolts on it, it steers the beam so it doesn't continue through the, the apparatus. But the other thing is the object slits and those are this box. And what that it contains is a pair of uh, heavy ground metal rods which are mounted on a V-shaped structure. And so you can see that if I bring these closer together, what I do, I have an adjustable aperture. And it's adjustable from closed out to about 150 microns. And so we have a capable possibility of adjusting the size of the beam by using this uh, cross slits. They came from uh, um, Baron Fischer in, in Germany. And from there, we have the 
first electrostatic lens is located inside this beam pipe here. And these pieces are motors which are used for uh, aligning the system. The two lenses are inside a metal tube, which I think you'll see a, a sample of it down there, out on the bench. So our first procedure is to align the two lenses inside this tube. So the two lenses are lined up with each other inside a tube, which is then brought down inside the, the beam pipe. And these actuators move the bottom of the tube around. Because what we have to have in line is the object aperture, the lenses, and the focal point. And so the, these objects, these things are, are for doing the alignment of, of the lens tube uh, with the, everything else. And uh, the second lens is, is uh, in this region uh, where the beam comes up out of the floor. And last we have the business end, that's the exit aperture. This is the, uh, uh, actually that one is the 400 nanometer thick silicon nitride uh, window. It's on a, has a little brass uh, surface around here that's to keep us from bumping into the window. Uh, this is the inside of the, uh, the stage. The uh, dish gets mounted on that. The cells are grown on a thin surface on the bottom of this dish. And this whole stage then is, is, uh, moves the, uh, the uh, cells around. And on top is the, uh, the uh, Nikon Eclipse microscope, which is used for the imaging. Uh, camera on top. Multi-photon laser comes in from here. Regular illumination comes in from the back. And the uh, objectives and the, the counter. The, this is a, a blown up picture of the counter. What we have is, actually when it's put together, there's a smallish aperture or eighth of an inch hole coming in the middle. So the ions are produced in the gas here as the particles come out. And off to the side here, there's a, a uh, actually it's down here, is a, a metal wire helix that produ is the outside surface of a proportional counter. And there's a very fine wire down the middle is where the ions are collected. And so that gives a, a pulse every time a, a particle comes through the middle of this. And that's the schematic uh, picture of what we have. And that's what a, that's a, a bead on the system. We'll do some practicing with this. You'll see how this really works uh, tomorrow. So the microscope stage actually has two parts. There's an outside frame which is moved by stepping motors. It can move plus or minus uh, five millimeters, which covers the, the size of our sample dish. And it uh, goes about two millimeters a second, but it has only about six micron resolution, which isn't adequate for aiming at things uh, with micron precision. So there's inside that, there's another stage, which is a piezoelectric drive stage, which has a plus or minus 100 micron movement in the X and the Y direction and, and 100 micron movement in the Z direction. And so the, uh, the movement capability of this stage matches the field of view of the high magnification lens that we use. And so all of our radiations are done. The, you, you move from place to place using the, the uh, core stage but you do your actual final positioning of, of cells using the fine stage. And as I say, you'll see this in a little more detail tomorrow. We have a control system that has lots of stuff on it. And you'll get to play with a little bit of these things tomorrow. There are pieces of it for moving the stage around. There are pieces of it for setting out how many counts you get. There's a part of it uh, for controlling the lens voltage, for controlling the camera gain, for controlling the uh, calibration between stage motion and camera position. There are functions for doing normal radiations or cytoplasmic radiations or bystander radiations, the type of experiment you're doing. Uh, and there are some other things. This, this is a histogram of the brightness of the image. Uh, so you can set thresholds for, for uh, uh, locating cells and so forth. So we'll do a little bit of details on this one. This is the uh, uh, move stage motion uh, by entering numbers in here. You can make relative motions 
or you can make an absolute motion or you can re reverse the motion you just made and when you do that motion the the stage position is uh, recorded on the main screen and uh, so the, it uses these things to keep track of where it is during the radiations and so forth. This is for controlling the, the number of counts that are detected. You put a number of ions that you want to count and when you click the start button or the control program clicks the start button it'll open the electrostatic shutter, wait for 10 counts to arrive, close the count, the, the shutter and report to the computer that it's done. Uh, these pieces of it have to do with uh, uh, taking pictures. Uh, this here, it says if you click that, you'll get a new picture. If you click this one, it says histogram. You'll, it'll generate this picture. This is the the brightness, and this is the log of the number of pixels that have that brightness. Binarize separates the bright areas from the dark areas, and get center of gravity finds the middle of objects that it's found in the binarization. I said this is for setting up the camera gain. This is for selecting which image type of image you're taking. This is you through the high magnification lens, through the low magnification lens. Uh, color, we have the capability of taking a three color image. Uh, if you have three different fluor fluorophores you can get, a, get an actual color picture of that. And when you do that, the, uh, the uh, gain on the camera uh, for the different colors is also independently adjustable. Um, yeah, this is the area that sets up the correlation, the, the relationship in the computer between the position of the stage, the number of steps you have to move the stage, which is related to the number of pixels you see a change in the, in the image. And you need to know that calibration in order to be able to take an object from somewhere in the image and put it where the beam is. And so that's those are what those are for. Uh, this is for uh, controlling irradiations. I say normal irradiation is hitting the center of any of the, any every nucleus you find. Cyto is to find nuclei and, and then shoot outside the nuclei in the where you would expect the cytoplasm to be. Uh, Band is something where you shoot across the middle of a sample in a, a line of chosen width, so you, you take a bunch of shots that way. We had a fellow visiting who wanted to do bystander effects with a circle, so you have his uh, dish with the uh, cells in it, and you draw a circle within that, and then shoot a certain number of particles around on that circle. Um, if you have another scheme, we'll program it in for you. So not so bad. Um, down here are some beam diagnostic uh, features, uh, bead scan and knife edge scan. Now a bead scan, all right, let's knife edge scan first. You have a, a dish that has two thin pieces of metal in it, which are crossed like this. This is the center of the dish, and there are two thin pieces of metal. And you put this initially so the particle beam is coming up through the open space. And with your solid state detector, you can see that the particles coming in have all of their energy. Now, if you move this over this way so the, the particles are going through the foil, they lose energy. They aren't stopped completely. You select the knife edge, they go through. So you can still count how many particles there are, but you can see that they've lost energy. And so they're behind the knife. And then what you do is you scan this across, and you can find the, the slope as the particles go from open area to under the knife and you can find the center of that so what you have is the width of the beam and the location of it and you do that in each direction uh, and that gives you the the spot size and its location and then what you can do is look down your microscope you put it in the location that found here you look down the microscope and you say that cross point is where the beam is and then you put another dish on that has fluorescent beads in it so these are things you can see with our fluorescent microscope, but they also, uh, when a particle goes through it, energy is lost. So you can look at particles that have not hit the bead and have hit the bead. But here you do a scan, actually we do it in a square pattern, but you scan around and you find the region where particles are going through the, the bead. 
and you put the bead in the middle of that, and that's where your beam is, and you take a picture of that uh, and set the zeros in the computer. You tell the computer uh, then where the beam is, having put a bead, had too many words, put the bead over the beam, and then take the picture, and that tells you where the zero is. That's, so that's the, the uh, two pieces of thin metal foil. And uh, here's a program that does that scan. You can tell how many steps. This is a, a, about a thir third of a micron per step. And uh, so it goes through and it tells you the X resolution here. It's about 0.8 microns in this particular day. And this shows you where it is. And we'll do that part of, part of our exercise tomorrow. This part of it is for controlling the lens. And there, you could use it by just uh, entering lenses for the voltages on the three components of the lens and uh, just set it, and it'll just go there. I mean, that's, these voltages are those. But if you do a, be a, a scan like this and the beam is two microns in diameter, we say that's no good. And how do you find the right diameter? Well, what you do is you adjust the lens voltages to get the, the best focal point. Now it's very tedious to try to do that by hand, so luckily Guy Gardy wrote a, put a program in here, it's called a simplex, and, it, and this is a particular kind of search routine which is very good at finding the optimum value of something. And so what the program does is it adjusts, we usually just adjust two of the voltages in a pattern, and at each voltage it does a scan and it selects based on what you find at three points how you ought to move one of them over and it will it takes if you're badly focused it might take you half an hour to to run this scan and to get to the the uh, appropriate spot size so that's uh when you say set it, it goes there uh it that's the scan again and that's the simplex that goes with it and this is the sort of th answer you get. Although well, we don't normally look at this, the computer has this internally, but you can get it out. What it's done is, in this region, 100% of the particles are going through the open area, and then there's a region where it's dropping down, and then they're down here uh, going through the, uh, uh, the foil. The slope of this gives you the, the size of the beam, and the 50% point gives you the, the location. So that's a knife edge scan. So these are the steps going through the bead scan. Uh, this is in gory detail. I think you have a, a slightly different version of it in your books there. But we'll go through this uh, as an exercise uh, tomorrow. Uh, but w what you get is a, a picture like this where the, the dark blue areas are where the particles are missing the bead and the red areas are where the particles are going through the bead and the either the program locates it or you can click on the center of this and that tells you where you have to move to actually center the the uh, bead on the uh, on the beam axis so this is um, protocols that actually this one we used last year it won't be quite this way this year but it's uh, One of the first things we do when we're doing an irradiation is to scan the dish, and that is to find the approximate location of the of the uh, cells. And here I, I messed up the illumination a bit so you could see where each frame is. But what we do is go through and here take uh, however many is this 13, I guess, frames to cover. This is the the whole area of the dish, six millimeters diameter, and within this you can find the lo approximate location of the cells. And then we will take high magnification images just of the regions where the cells are. Uh, this is another a scan of another uh, device we use for alignment. And the, the other part of the alignment you need is that the stage motion has to be square with the camera in order to get everything right. And so this is a grid which has got, uh, these, are, these are half millimeter uh, squares and this is the mosaic 
uh, where we have it so that there it matches up very well at the joints between these uh, these things is there there's a little bit of you know mismatch here but that's so that's the something we do if the camera were not square with the stage there would be very ragged uh, edges uh, on these uh, spots where the uh, images join so that's a an image of a scan the the, the uh, this is a dish this is the six millimeter diameter and these are individual uh, cells or maybe beads I don't can't tell which uh, so we know where these are if we were going to scan this area with a high magnification lens we would be taking lots of pictures of empty space and so this is the reason for our initial scan so we know which high magnification frame would contain this cell and we would know that there, there's no reason to go here because there's nothing there and so we the, the this initial scan tells us where to go with the high magnification lens to find things that are interesting to shoot so here's the microscope final objective with the uh, gas counter mounted to it here's with the dish there's a small space between the uh, where the cells are and the entrance to the uh, detector this is the helix that is the actual detector itself in the center where so the ions are produced in this region and they drift over collected by the helix and then multiplied on the on the center wire and that's a bigger picture from what I showed before here's the helix in the, in the center wire of that counter these two resistors are for setting up the ratio of the fields on the center wire and the helix and allows us to use only a single connection to the counter we use P10 gas in that you could use any any counter gas here it isn't significant um, so this is a picture of some cells which were located these are ones that express GFP in fact this is the system that Alan will demonstrate to you this afternoon so what we've done here is use the the uh, diffuse GFP which is within this cell to locate the nucleus of the cell and we find the center of gravity of the cell and that's what these little green X's are that's where we're intending to shoot and then where the focal point focus comes up is where we actually shot and you see we're a good registration of, of that um, so this is the normally or most often we do experiments where the cells are stained with Herxt which gives a much brighter signal than, than the, this GFP does but this is adequate for, for finding and it's a good demonstration that we're hitting where we claim we want to